other articles and a thousand other book reviews. And all I can tell you is that word PhD that farmer used, that's the right answer. Not that it's unworthy, but far from climbing up, it seems graduate students dig down deeper and deeper until they've mastered everything about six words in a book that's been hidden in the library for 300 years. And I'm impressed, but I'm not, well, I guess I'm not impressed. Our higher education system seems more bent on creating ever more perfect examples of scholarship about the smallest thing, and yet we struggle to equip children to be citizens. Our leaders tell us we should push for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics so that they can compete in the global marketplace. And if you ask people what education should be about, it's so we can create people who can innovate and compete and excel in the struggle for economic growth and success. So we have two different pathways there were different ways to take steps. One, the long common march that's being obliterated by history. The other, the solitary climb up to Mount Parnassus, which apparently looks down upon the specializations so precise you can't even find them. But they have something in common. They really do. Each is about a goal and a journey and the way they have to go, to go to get there. The idea of a journey is essential. We talk about it every week, that the spiritual life is not a destination, but a journey. And we should talk more about that. So I'm going to give you a few moments to ponder this idea that whether or not we're going in lockstep as members of the Union or climbing the mountain up to Olymp Olympian heights so we can become learned, they all share the idea of traveling from here to there, of going from one place in our life to another. The idea of the journey is where I want us to go today. Whether it's about Odysseus coming back from Ith Troy to Ithaca, and from which we get the word Odyssey, or Moses and Israel trudging through the wilderness for 40 years, all religions talk about journeys, stories of pilgrims, abound in every religion. What is it that speaks so powerfully when we talk about this image of the journey that can inform these disparate things, Wisconsin elections and modern education? For that, I turn to a poem by Constantine Cavafy. It's itself almost a century old. When you set out on your journey to Ithaca, Pray the road is long, full of adventure, full of knowledge, full of Lestragonians and Cyclops. The angry Poseidon, don't fear them. You will never find such as these on your path if your thoughts remain lofty, if a fine emotion touches your spirit and your body. The Lestragonians and the Cyclops, the fierce Poseidon, you will never encounter if you do not carry them in your soul, if your soul does not set them up before you. Pray that the road is long that the summer mornings are many, when with much pleasure and such joy you will enter ports seen for the first time, stop at Phoenician markets and purchase fine merchandise, mother of pearl and coral, amber and ebony, and sensual perfumes of all kinds, as many sensual perfumes as you can. Visit many Egyptian cities and learn from the scholars. Always keep Ithaca on your mind. To arrive there is your ultimate goal, but do not hurry the voyage at all. It is better that it last for many years. And to anchor at the island when you are old, rich with all you have gained on the way, not expecting that Ithaca will offer you riches. Ithaca has given you a beautiful voyage. Without her, you would never set out on the road. She has nothing more to give you. And if you find her poor, Ithaca has not deceived you wise as you have become, with so much experience. You must have already understood that, what Ithaca means. Wisdom is the point. Wisdom, that sense not only of knowing but of understanding, of forgiving as well as being committed to things. In Proverbs, there's a lovely verse, Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out seven pillars. You may have heard that reference in T.E. Lawrence's book, 
the seven pillars of wisdom. And I'm going to use that number to give you seven things that you can think of as the ways of wisdom. Not the way to it, but the things you need to become wise, because that's what all journeys are about. They're about the path to wisdom, which is to be complete, to be true, to be human. They come in three pairs and a spare. That way it'll be easy for you to remember. The first you have to know is knowledge. You cannot be wise and be ignorant. It is simply not possible, Thomas Gray's poem about Eaton notwithstanding. There is no place where there is ignorance to be, where it is, where there is bliss to be ignorant. Knowledge is important. Our infant brains awake, drinking up knowledge. When we have learned, we cannot stop. It's how we live. To, lo to learn, to grow is to learn, to learn is to grow. It's how we become human. But the pair that goes, the other, the opposite that goes with that is ignorance. The fabled oracle at Delphi was asked once, who was the wisest man in the world? And the oracle answered, Socrates, because he knows that he doesn't know. Anyone like me or you who has read enough books knows that there are 10,000 books published every day. You can't keep up. It won't happen. There is more knowledge than you can find, and you will remain largely ignorant for all of your life. And the more you learn, the less you actually know. So knowledge begets in a wise man or woman an awareness of ignorance. You need knowledge and ignorance to be wise. That's the first pair, knowledge and ignorance. Here's the next pair, victory and defeat. We all love getting a good grade on our report card, show it to mother, ah, oh, that's wonderful, or we, or we succeed at something in our work, or we have the respect of friends. These are wonderful things. They encourage us. They get us to keep going when life is rugged. We know we can do it. Like the little engine that could, we poke along thinking we can always do better, and this is essential because we cannot be discouraged or we give up. And yet, we need defeat even more not to lower us or humble us or humiliate us, but have you ever thought for a moment how often when something went well you thought, how did that happen? Chances are you didn't. You just had a good time. Hurrah for me. But when you fail, you think, how did that happen? We ponder our failures more than our successes. And from our failures, we come to know more than from our victories. It is important not only that we succeed, but that we fail. But we should fail, as a book I read long ago said, fail forward into the next adventure. Victory and defeat are essential to wisdom. The next pair, love and loss. Now, I mean love not in the panting, romantic sense, but the desire to be connected deeply with others, whether it's with one's family or with a mate or your own children. Desire starts out just wanting something for you, but eventually love, you discover, is in not the getting, but in the giving as well. And it's from the people we love that we learn what we don't know. It's how we stumble through life. We fail the people we love, and then they forgive us and we can try again. Do you see where I'm going? We need to have the love, the trust, the connection to be engaged in the world. But we also need to realize that loss is built into the system. Every wedding I've ever performed has something about until death us do part. And of course, no couple really takes that terribly seriously. But if you really are married, You've already committed yourself to at least one of you being a widow. When we ponder those things, we should ponder those things, because we will lose things all through our lives. We lose our youth, we lose our dreams, we lose our family, our friends, we eventually lose our own lives. And loss is a powerful, is a powerful teacher. It reminds us that nothing we do or have lasts forever, to cherish what we have before us and also to let go when it must go, it makes us remember how tenuous is our purchase on the planet. If it isn't humiliating, it is humbling. So there are the three pairs, knowledge and ignorance. You need them both. Victory and defeat, you need them both. Love and loss, you need them both to be wise. And the only way to get all of them is to get old. I'm sorry, it is a cliché but I've never met a wise 10-year-old, although I know many non-wise 90-year-olds. 
Age does not guarantee wisdom, but it is the only way to obtain it one way or the other. In fact, it's one of the few things we can look forward to as we get old, since we're losing everything else. No, that isn't true. But wisdom is real. It is powerful. It is true. It takes time to learn, to unlearn, to succeed, to fail, to love, and to lose. These things cannot be books. They have to be moments. As I said in the early worship service today, there's a fabled story that says when you reach the pearly gates, that wonderful metaphor for judgment, you are looked over not for medals but for scars. You are granted dignity through the endurances as well as the successes, and that comes with age. Now let's apply this very briefly to those two sets of steps. Look at Wisconsin. I've studied and know that the struggles of today, as you now know, are a century old. Did we, ever th did we seriously think they could not be undone? I could chafe at doing it all over again, but do we not do everything all over again? Do we tie our shoes once and forever? Do we eat once? No. We must do it always, over and over. Victories will always bring defeats. Wisdom chastens our simple expectation that progress is inevitable, that people, once they've been informed, will always do the right thing, and it goes us on to be stick with it, because if we don't, nothing will stay. When Jesus rejects his own family in the gospel, he makes us think that we have to choose our choices. We must choose our connections. They are not granted us. We have to make them real. That's what wisdom tells us to do. Accept the limits we have and then do not accept being limited after that. Look at our education problems as I've gestured to. And we all are, no, not all of us, most of us in this room I remember when we were in school and how much better it was then and how charming it was and none of us ever acted out. And we all got A's. No, it wasn't true then. But there is a fact that was years ago, a half a century or more ago, there were schools embedded in neighborhoods that had businesses and houses of worship and neighbors, and that whole complex is what raised us up and reared us up. We didn't just go to school. We saw our teachers in our neighborhoods. Our parents worked in local stores, and we went to local churches, and together they all raised us up, and that's changed. We live in this suburb, work in that suburb. We go to that church over here. We go to that school over there. We no longer live in communities. We shop for our lives. We don't live in them. And then we wonder why it is we can't get educated because we are busy assembling communities when we used to live in them.